it's a great pleasure uh, that we have Prasad Pellekar as a seminar speaker today. So uh, Prasad did his PhD from IIC, uh, Rahul Pandit, with Rahul Pandit. And then, uh, uh, then uh, he went to Indovan uh, for postdoc. And he also visited Harvard during the time. And after that, he returned to India. And he is a faculty in TIFR Center, uh, TCIES. And his interests are uh, turbulence, buoyancy driven flows with bubbly flows, uh, and miscellaneous topics. Okay. So, Prasad, please uh, yeah. take over. And Thanks, Manindra. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and good evening, everyone. So, uh, what I would be talking about is uh, <clears throat> what is called a pseudo turbulence in buoyancy driven bubbly flows. And this work was mostly done by uh, Vikash and Rashmi. Who, so Vikash has just recently graduated. Uh, Rashmi uh, will graduate soon. And Dhrubaditya Mitra, who has been a long standing collaborator. And uh, the details of what I'm going to talk about, uh, you can find in these three articles. Uh, and so, OK, let's get started. Uh, so first question is why bubbly flows? Why one should worry about bubbly flows in the first place? And the answer to that question is actually uh, very simple. It's because, you know, they are all around us. You have it in chemical reactors. When you boil a cup of tea, you have bubbly flows. And also they are ubiquitous in geothermal vents and seabeds. And typically they are known to enhance mixing or uh, oxygen uh, content in the liquids. So one would therefore like to understand what kind of flows these bubbles create when they rise. Uh, is that flow turbulent? Uh, and if not, uh, whether it's chaotic, how, do I, how are we going to characterize it? All right, and uh, so there's a IIT Kanpur connection to it. So the thing is that, you know, I started to think about this problem something like three years ago. And I still remember when I was talking to Sagar, who is a good friend, uh, about this problem. He so just to amuse him, I took this photograph of bubbles which are rising in a fish tank in IIT Kanpur guest house visitors hostel. And but it's very instructive nonetheless because uh, what you should see here are two things, which is that as the bubbles rise, the trajectories that they make are not straight upward, but they make oscillatory trajectories. Secondly, even in this simple flow, they come in various sizes. And uh, you see they are rising fairly fast. So you would expect that the flow that they generate as they rise is going to be quite chaotic, right? So if I wanted to sketch the flow that one would have based on the pictures uh, that we just now saw, it would be the following, that you have bubbles which are rising due to buoyancy. The gravity is, of course, acting downwards. As they rise, they generate wakes. These wakes interact with the bubbles, which are uh, at the back of the leading bubble, and they create more complex flows. You could think of more complicated scenarios where there is also some large scale driving or steering, which interacts with these bubbles. And so if you naively think about it, uh, if you come from turbulence uh, background, you would say, okay, what are the scales of this problem? And the answers would be, well, if there is a background turbulence present in the system, then there would be injection scale, which is coming because of the large scale steering. The bubbles themselves, when they rise under because of buoyancy, would be injecting energy into the fluid. And so there is a scale of bubble diameter. And then there has to be some small scale uh, which is typically the viscous dissipation scale where all the energy should get dissipated. That's the naive thinking that one would have. And as a fluid dynamist, then you would ask that, you know, okay, instead of worrying about exactly what liquid I work with, uh, I would like to know what are the, all the possible non-dimensional numbers. And then, you know, if you have a large scale steering, then you have Reynolds number. You have the bubble scale Reynolds number also. Then there is a Galilee number. Uh, which is, again, the ratio of bubble inertia to viscous dissipation. Uh, for those of you who, uh, I mean, who are aware, aware from bubble, bubble literature, 
they should realize that if the rise velocity of the bubble be zero in this Reynolds number, if you approximate it as a square root of delta rho times GD, then this Reynolds number and the Galilee number that I write are identical. So you could club these two. Then you have bond number, which is the ratio of buoyancy to surface tension. So if your bond number is large, that would typically mean that the surface tension is small. And as the bubble rises, it would deform a lot. On the other hand, if the bond number is small, which means that the surface tension effects are overwhelming, then you would have a scenario where bubbles are nearly spherical. Another number that seems like a crucial number is that what is the density contrast between the gas of which the bubble is made up of and the surrounding liquid. If you think of air water system, then this Artwood number would be something like 0.99. Another number would be, of course, the viscosity contrast. Again, if you think of air water system, then the viscosity of the bubble to the viscosity of the fluid is order 10 raised to minus 2. So, you know, there is a viscosity contrast of order 100 over there. Then, of course, there is volume fraction. And you could also define an uh, indicator which is in the literature called as bubblets, where one asks, what is the ratio of the turbulence intensity in absence of bubbles to the flow intensity that is generated in presence of bubbles only? So that's denoted by this parameter B. There's volume fraction, of course, I said. Now, if you have, you, you have this B is equal to zero, that would be the regime where you have no bubbles and you only have fluid turbulence. On the other hand, the limit of B is equal to infinity would be the case where you switch off turbulence and you have only bubbles which are generating the flow. Okay, and so this is broadly the sketch or the picture in which we would like to work about. And we would like to know what are the flows therefore which are generated in such a scenario. On the left, what I show is a typical experimental setup uh, which has been used actually quite a lot to understand bubbly flows. Uh, experimentally. So now with all these uh, things, there is of course a question which uh, anyone would ask that the parameter space is quite large. And so how you would like to understand this problem, whether you know one should have this four dimensional space of Reynolds, Galilee, Bond, Artwood B. And then uh, as you change the value, do the properties of the flow dramatically change? So you know any new experiment you do, you have to redo the simulation to only know the answer or is there a universal theory which binds everything together and you need not worry about the details about let's say the output or the uh, volume fraction but you can only talk let's say in terms of one or two non-dimensional numbers so we'll think about that so how do i approach this problem well i don't do experiments but we try to attack these problems numerically so the equations that one has is the continuity equation, which is del Tc is zero, which tells you how does phases, one of the phases gets infected by the flow. We assume the flow to be incompressible. Then you have the Navier-Stokes equation, which all of you would know about. You have the standard inertia, viscous dissipation, pressure, force because of surface tension, and the force because of gravity. Uh, because we are thinking of two phase flows and the viscosity in each of the phases is different, the viscosity is a function of the phase. So it is equal to mu f in the uh, bubble phase, or sorry, in the liquid phase and mu b in the bubble phase. Similarly, the density is equal to rho f in the liquid phase and rho b in the bubble phase. Uh, the function c changes, takes a value zero in the bubble phase and is equal to one in the liquid phase or in the fluid phase. All right, and how do we solve these equations? So if you invoke Boussinesque approximation, whereas you work in small output number regime, in which case you can assume the inertia term rho c delta u as some constant density times delta u, and one could use the pseudo spectral method. That's what we use for small output numbers. And for high output numbers, we use a second order finite volume solver which is an open source solver called Paris. For both these solvers, the bubbles are advected using a front tracking algorithm and front is evolved using either a 
Euler time update or a Runge Gupta method. But I'll come back to it again when I could show hopefully some pictures. So let's see. Uh, mm -hmm. Go back a bit. Uh, yes. Uh, here, C is the bubble, right? Uh, C is a no, C is a, C is a continuous function whose value is equal to, so it's like a sharp interface, which is one in the liquid phase, and it then becomes, it decreases sharply and becomes zero in the bubble phase. So the, uh, the width over which it goes from one to zero is typically three lattice units. Okay, so it's extremely sharp. So imagine that you were in the uh, fluid phase or the liquid phase, then you would have C1. So mu C will be equal to mu F. In the bubble phase, C is equal to zero. So mu C will be equal to mu B. So mu is the viscosity, no? Mu is the viscosity, the dynamic viscosity. So mu B is uh, air, air viscosity, is that correct? Yeah, mu B is the air viscosity and mu F, if you think of fluid as water, is the water viscosity. So, so air is rising so because of uh, buoyancy. That exactly. factor, where is, it, uh, where is it included in this equation? So right now, you remember the gravity is rho times g. All right. right. So the buoyancy would directly come in from here. Now, if you use periodic boundaries, you would do rho minus rho average g, and that would give you the buoyancy again. So there is a, if you had walls, you would have a hydrostatic balance, right? Which would give you a linear profile. So you are basically doing a, a two fluid, average, basically two fluid mix. Well, it's yes. a single fluid model actually rather than exactly. two fluid model. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes. Okay. No, normally we do two fluid uh, temperature and velocity separate. Any yes. Thanks. Yeah. I have a quick question, oh. uh, Prasad. Yes. Uh, so this, this F sigma, what does it uh, look like? The surface tension force? Okay. So the surface tension force is uh, the surface tension the coefficient of surface tension times the curvature times okay. uh, Dirac delta on the interface itself. Okay, thank you. So wherever you have interface, uh, it takes a value one and it's sigma kappa. So it's exactly how Chandrasekhar would, uh, you know, take into account service tension when he thinks of a Kelvin Helmholtz instead. Okay, okay, fine. Excuse right. me, maybe may I ask you, do you, do you use a divergence free condition for velocity? Because yes. But uh, then you, you somehow C should be included because otherwise uh, the it is not divergence free because do you apply it for the fluid or for the uh, mix mixture of the of two uh, components? Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm assuming that, uh, so in this particular single fluid picture, uh, the U is the hydrodynamic velocity. Okay, so it's the velocity of the mixture per se. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, uh, right. at least I understand your your setup. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead. All right. Okay. So now let's start with the case where we don't have a large scale steering, and you have only bubbles which are rising. Uh, due to buoyancy and they generate some wake flow, uh, wake flow and this wake flow interact with each other and generate some chaotic uh, structures, right? So as I said, flow is generated by bubble wake interaction. And one of the questions which bothered us a lot was that there are too many dimensionless parameter and does pseudo turbulence depends on all of these. And the reason for the worry was the following, that actually if you take, so below I, quote the numbers which are from experiments. So the Galilee number, which again, just to remind everyone, is the ratio of bubble inertia to the viscous dissipation. It's like a Reynolds number. It varies between 200 to 1,000. The outward number, which is tells you about the density contrast, is very large, right? It's 0.999. The bond number is varying between 1 to 5. The viscosity contrast is order 100, 0 0.02. And the volume fraction is very small, 2.5. Person. And if typically what happens is that if you have very large density contrast, the numerical simulations are extremely stiff and extremely cumbersome to do. So then the question was, if we really want to understand this phenomena, the easiest thing would be to do a small output number simulation, but then would it have anything to do with the experiment? So what should I keep picked? Should I 
just change the Galilee number, and art, the flow that is generated is not so sensitive to the output number or bond number, or every the flows are sensitive to all the parameters, right? So that's the question we had. And so let's start. So the question is the first, let's look at the experiments. So in the experiments, what people do is uh, they typically plot the frequency spectrum. So you put a probe in the fluid and you keep on monitoring the time series of the velocity fluctuations. And from that, you evaluate the power spectral density. And what people find is for range of frequencies or in terms of scales, for scales smaller than the bubble diameter, you have a K raised to minus three scaling. This was first found by in this interesting paper by Lance and Bata in 91, where, so again, this was an experimental paper where they said that energy is primarily decimated, uh, dissipated in the proximity of the bubbles. They assume because it's the transfer is local. Therefore, they said that, look, the energy production should be energy dissipated in the wakes in the proximity of the bubbles times K inverse. And because the, whatever I'm generating is getting dissipated locally, I should balance it with viscous dissipation. And that would give me a K raised to minus three scaling. Now, of course, when you make such an argument, you are making an assumption. The assumption is that the contributions because of the fluid nonlinearities are negligible. There is no nonlinear transfer of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is relevant over here. And then they argue that that should be because the time scales of dissipation uh, should be smaller than the time scales of energy production because of the buoyancy. And the time scales of nonlinear transfers would be much larger than these two scales. Now, is this argument true? No one ever tested it. And this was another thing which we wanted to test. Whether so this energy is production, or... why is it K minus one? Uh... Okay, so what they assume is that the energy transfer is local. And so that, so you see, if I look at the transfer function, it I can approximate it as the pi, which is the, whatever is the flux, which is appearing because of whatever are the production mechanisms divided by K. So that was the approximation. And so the production mechanism is energy generated in the wakes. So therefore the transfer should be epsilon omega by K. So that's their argument. Okay. Uh, Prasad, I have one question actually. Yes, Sukriti. Yeah, so uh, I mean, when you do this type of phenomenological argument that there is a balance between viscous dissipation and the energy production by the wakes. Yes. Is there, I mean, and actually even before that you are uh, defining this E, I mean, epsilon omega. So yeah. what is the somehow, I mean, in any case, I mean, even in a crude sense, there is a gap, I mean, where is the guarantee that that should be something scale independent or something? No, so that's why I put up a question mark. Okay. So you see, this was a proposition. Okay. Right? okay. And that's why I said, what is the origin? And this was a proposition. No one ever tested it numerically. Right, okay. you you believe it that that's what is going to be, but is it true? Right, so that's the question which we started off with, because most of the work in this was coming from experiments, okay. and there was no direct evidence to check. Because you see, if you want to check this, you have to do a scale by scale budget. Okay. There's no way out. Right. 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 Of course. Okay. And another another small question is that whenever you write minus five third and minus three, like very blindly, it comes to mind. Is there any possibility of having another quadratic invariant type of thing like uh, so? Maybe nothing to do with this, but just in case. So you. So. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Okay. So uh, I rather I must confess I haven't thought about it very carefully. But uh, well, I can see of uh, think of one. But uh, as we go along, you would see what is the budget. Sure, sure, from there sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Shad, can I ask a question before yes. moving here? Yeah. Um. So you draw the frequency spectrum, but you talk here about the wave number k to the minus three. So yes. are frequency and k same here with Taylor hypothesis? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So what they use is a Taylor hypothesis, and then they they put up the correspondence. Got it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now let's uh, before we delve into what happens when you have many many bubbles, let's start by asking what happens for a single bubble, and is there any hope? Because remember, I told you that. The experiments have these parameters. Galilee is between 200 to 1,000. Artwood is close to one. 
and gamma is 0.02, volume fraction is 2.5. So to see this phenomena, do I really need to mimic the experiments or you know, I can work with uh, lower art code or something else? Is there something universal? So the first thing was a bit disheartening, right? You see the dynamics of single bubble, you change the Galilee number and you change the output number. You see that individual bubbles, depending upon their Galilee or output number, have very different trajectories, have very different shape and motion. And of course, their wake flows are very different. The only hope at some level is that if you look at Galilee 420 or 360, although the motion of the individual bubbles is quite different, the wave flow is quite long. So if you have many bubbles and the bubbles interact with each other, maybe the motion of individual bubbles won't matter so much. What is the exact wave flow might not be so relevant. So let's start with that and let's see how does a flow configuration looks like. Okay, so on the left, I have a flow configurations at Galilee 420, but a small output number. This is how individual bubble flow looks like. And this is how the flow is generated in the simulation. And you see that the bubbles and the wakes are interacting and you start to see something which is very different than what a single bubble flow looks like. Although if you see it carefully, you can see the resemblance. Now you can also do the same game for high output number and Galilee around 360. And again, you see the following picture that the wakes are interacting and you get a complex flow pattern, right? So what the observations you make is that, uh, you know, the bubbles rise, they are nearly ellipsoidal and uh, you know, they generate some kind of complex flow, which would like to think of as pseudo turbulence. We need to characterize it further. And then although individual bubble flows are very different, when you look at the suspension, the flow looks resemble very similar flow structures. And maybe there is a hope that therefore there is some universality hidden over here. So let's first look at very simple thing. What happens to the bubble shapes? Well, as you increase the Galilee number, you would expect that the shapes to become more and more deformed. That's what happens. So if you define the surface area, uh, sorry, the surface area of the bubble versus surface area of a spherical bubble, right? As you increase Galilee number, irrespective of whether you are looking at output number or uh, you know what is the bond number, you find for a fixed bond number, you consistently find that as you increase the Galilee number, the, surface, the bubbles get more deformed, their surface area goes up. Then if you think of kinetic energy budget in the system, there is something which is very simple. The idea is that you have time rate of change of kinetic energy plus the as the bubble deforms, there is an elastic energy due to surface tension with the bubbles. So that also you can write it as a time rate of change. And that should be equal to viscous dissipation plus the energy injected because of buoyancy. And in the steady state, what you expect is that the energy injected should be equal to energy dissipated by viscosity. And that's what we find within you know, whatever small errors we have, right? So that's made us happy that, okay, we have a steady state regime. And so, and for a large range of uh, output and bond number. So let's see whether the flow that we generate, whether they are similar to what are observed in experiments or not. Okay, so let's start with the first question, whether the viscous dissipation is equal to, so I already showed you viscous dissipation is same as energy injection but I can also find out how much is the energy dissipated in the wakes, right? And if we have to believe Lance and Bakal, then what I should expect is whatever I'm dissipating should be nearly equal to whatever is the energy is, which is getting dissipated in the wakes. And that's what one finds, that the energy dissipated in the wakes is comparable to viscous dissipation and that's comparable to energy injection. So that's fine, we are still talking about average quantities. They seem to be consistent with what Lance and Batalet found, and they seem to be consistent irrespective of the output number or the, uh, sorry, irrespective of the output number that I'm using. So with that, we make the first observation. If you look at all these properties more carefully, what you find is the following, that although this inequality that Lance and Batal had proposed, that viscous dissipation time scale is smaller than the time scale of production 
is smaller than the time scale of nonlinear transfer that holds it's as you go on cranking up the reynolds or the galilee number the difference between the uh, production because of buoyancy and the nonlinear transfer goes on narrowing down so you would see that at galilee or reynolds of 104 tau p and tau t are 17 and 48 so there is a quite large difference but as we increase the reynolds or the galilee number the difference really decreases it's only a factor of 1 point something all right so then the question is most probably at the large galilee number which experiments are accessing the non linear transfers could also be relevant although they might be small but still could be relevant okay so, i'll ask one question uh, yes please so yeah. at what scale is injection by one c uh, it should be small scale right is it correct no so it's at the bubble scales so bubble is uh, um, bubble is the mechanical the viscous scale bubble Sorry. is vis so it should be the matching at the viscous scale that means yes. uh, so is it at the viscous scale i mean if you plot it to the so, spectrum good point so i'll uh, if you just wait for few minutes when i come to the energy budget i'll clarify that point my brother all right okay okay because that's a uh, you you have asked a very relevant question but you know uh, to explain it i need to show the budget okay so right now okay. just believe me that uh, at least if you do the analysis of all these uh, quantities you find that at large reynolds number the nonlinear transfer and the uh, the production mechanism should have similar time scales all right but before we go ahead let's ask ourselves a simpler question the flow that we generate is it similar to experiments or it's very different right so the red triangle and diamonds are the so red triangle are the data from the experiments the purple diamonds are the data from numerical simulations of our earlier group at output point 99 and the curves are from our simulations at different output numbers and different galilee numbers but the galilee numbers are in the experimental range and what we find is that the core of the pdf is well reproduced by our simulations note that in the x component of velocity fluctuations in the experiments of mercado you find these large wings which are forming that the authors argue is most probably because the experiments have walls which generate some kind of a horizontal flow such a thing is not Uh, accessible to us or in the earlier simulations of rogue here because we don't have walls we use periodic boundaries all sides the similarly you know in the vertical velocity fluctuations the core of the pdf is well reproduced by us and is consistent with earlier simulations also the next thing we can look at is what about liquid uh, phase velocity fluctuations here the agreement is even better the x the horizontal component so the Uh, so this is another experiment by ribu and others the red the purple triangles are experimental data and the continuous lines are our simulations uh, for different output and uh, galilee numbers both small so r2 r3 r5 are small output r6 is large output and we see that the core of the pdf is well reproduced at these moderate galilee numbers and it does not depend strongly on the output number that one is using the same is true for the vertical velocity fluctuations the discrepancy is that you observe at very large values of ux and uz are most probably because of that's where you know what the individual wake structure is coming into picture but if you are interested in core pdf which is what most experiments look at it looks like it doesn't depend sensitively on the galilee number that you are look on the output number that you are looking at all right so with that we were much more hopeful and so we started by looking at the energy spectrum first at low output number and what we found was very encouraging that as you increase the reynolds or the galilee number the energy spectrum starts to show something which resembles k raised to minus 3 so that was very encouraging now to understand whether this k raised to minus 3 by the way the k raised to minus 3 is observed for scales which are so x axis is normalized by kd so the k minus 3 is observed for scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter or in wave numbers k which are greater than kd 
Now, once you do that, you quickly want to look at the scale by scale energy budget. And for that, the procedure. KD, KD is a bubble, bubble, uh, inverse of bubble size, right? KD, uh, not KD the whole model. inverse of the bubble size, exactly. I see. Yeah. So let's see, it's a one, okay, one and beyond, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fine. Okay. So then, uh, once you have all these things, we wanted to look at the scale by scale energy budget. And the procedure we followed is uh, what is used by IIN or Boru and ORSAC or Pope. Or even if one want, we also did it, but one could also do the same game in spectral space, which is actually very well described in Mahindra's book on energy transfers and fluid flows. So you do the standard scale by scale transfer. And what you have is then that there is a nonlinear flux, right? Plus the transfer because of the surface tension term, which I write here as FK sigma, that should be equal to viscous dissipation plus the energy injection because of the buoyancy. And then if there was a large scale steering, then energy injection did because of the large scale steering. So that's the mechanism that you have, that you would have nonlinear transfers because of the nonlinear term in Navier-Stokes equation. The surface tension term also can lead to a nonlinear transfer because remember, as the bubble are getting elongated, they absorb energy from the fluid and then they relax. So why capillary waves, they can also pump in energy back into the fluid. So then there is also a nonlinear transfer, which you can check for yourself, which is due to surface tension. And there is a unique dissipation mechanism, which is because of viscosity. And then you have the energy injection terms because of the gravity or external steering, if there is any. So what is F sign, uh, uh, this F sigma? So it sign is, of F sigma is a negative or positive or negative? Huh, so in, in this particular case, the F sigma K is uh, negative. All right, but it's it's actually it's sign doesn't matter that much because if you look at the transfer, that gives you the right thing, right? So okay, yeah, go on, please. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the steady state, what do we expect? So if you only have b is equal to zero, then you have pi k plus f k sigma should be equal to some of these two terms. In homogeneous isotropic turbulence, the flux is equal to uh, viscous dissipation plus the steering. So let's look at the scale by scale budget first at low output number. And here for uh, what I only plotted are the magnitudes. So you see the viscous dissipation therefore looks positive, but it's actually coming with a minus sign. Similarly, F sigma has a minus sign over there. But what is important to note is that the energy injected by buoyancy, which is Fg, so these are cumulative, right? So it saturates above the bubble diameter, which means, and it increases around the bubble diameter, which means that the bubbles are injecting energy around the scales which correspond to their bubble diameter. The viscous dissipation starts to act at certain scales, which is larger than the bubble diameter, but you have both the nonlinear transfer and the transfer because of the surface tension term. Although the nonlinear transfer is small and their sum is indicated by this purple colored curve. On the other hand, when you increase the Reynolds or the Galilee number, then you have something much more interesting, which is that now the net transfer because of the surface tension plus the nonlinearity is this purple curve, which agrees with what Lance and Batal would have said that the net production would go as some constant times k inverse. So in this cumulative picture, that would show up as log k, right? Because if you take derivative, that would give you the transfer. So that's what we find that as you go on increasing the Galilee number, at the large Galilee numbers, which experiments work with, you do see that the net production or the net transfer would go as k inverse, or in this cumulative budget, it would go as log k. However, it's not just because of the surface tension contribution or the production mechanism is actually both the transfer because of the local transfer because of the surface tension as well as nonlinear transfers. All right, so both are present. Uh, so there's a question in the chair. Why buoyancy based energy decreased with uh, increase in Reynolds to RE to 300? So you are saying that, uh, all right. So in these uh, simulations, the way we are uh, doing it 
we uh, so if i remember correctly the way we compare no let me see this uh, are you correct so this is uh, 0 to uh, four in oh no i think there is a typo here this should be order 10 raised to minus 2 most probably i'll check it all right because the energy is going to increase so maybe i just copy paste it all right but i'll just cross check it okay uh but you what is clear over here is that the net production has clearly increased and you have the transfer both because of the nonlinear term as well as the surface tension term so the net production is coming because of both of that and then for scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter this production balances the surface tension leading to a k raised to minus 3 spectrum which you see over here which is uh, very evident right the red colored curve is for the largest reynolds number all right so that's how uh, we have set it up uh, so let's go ahead then so uh, so at least it's giving a evidence that if you are at largest galilee number then it's actually what lance and batal said uh, you have something similar that the net production is balancing viscous dissipation but the mechanism of net production is both the nonlinear transfer as well as the transfer due to the surface tension term which was not uh, correct in the lance and batal picture uh so with this uh, okay so that's what i reiterated uh, just a moment back so at least we therefore know that you have uh, the pseudo turbulence at large galilee number even at low output numbers and uh, you know you have the liquid velocity fluctuations are also correctly represented but now the question is therefore the other way that does this picture hold also at large output number so that's what we did so this is the energy spectrum at large output number simulations where again the galilee number is around 400 and you again see the k raised to minus 3 scaling appearing for scales smaller than bubble diameter however these were done at moderate resolutions now we have much bigger simulations here also so you see that near the tail you have some bump appearing the if you again look at the energy budget uh then you again find that the net production which is because of the surface tension plus the nonlinear transfer balances the viscous dissipation for scales which are smaller than bubble diameter leading to a k raised to minus 3 spec all right so both at low and high output number the mechanism which leads to the k raised to minus 3 scaling is identical although of course you know if you look do the energy budget carefully at large output numbers the energy budget is much more complex because you have to take care of the momentum term as well as the advective term properly or u and rho u terms properly but if you do that you do find that the the overall energy budget is still telling you that net transfer because of nonlinearities plus surface tension balances viscous dissipation giving you the k raised to minus 3 spectrum so therefore the pick, so then you know what we had one final uh, question which was that well you know we have looked at these things only in real space so in frequency space does it matter it does it agree also our high output number simulations are at output point 9 if someone did a simulation exactly at the experimental values would this picture still go through so to our surprise first uh, what we did was we compared our output point 8 simulations we ran it for a very long time measured liquid velocity fluctuations made the power spectrum exactly as the experimentalists and then we compared the energy spectrum that we obtained from our simulations at output point 8 and galileo reynolds of 465 with those of experiments which were done at by prakash et al at output point 997 and to our surprise they matched extremely well furthermore there was a more recent study uh by the uh, innocenti and others where they did simulations at output point 99 and what they found is that the results that we had obtained which is this red colored uh, sorry green colored spectrum and the results of their simulations which is the red colored spectrum are actually on top of each other and these were again at very different output numbers 
So overall, therefore, we were quite happy that the picture that one gets is that the, the turbulence which the bubbles generate is quite universal. It doesn't depend so strongly on the output number because output, large output number, not only the simulations are more difficult, to analyze it is also much more challenging. Uh, so at least the statistical properties of liquid fluctuations at these small volume fractions is universal, doesn't depend so much on the output number. And if you therefore work only with Galilee number, you are fine. If you are in the right Galilee number range, for scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter, you would see the pseudo turbulence scaling, which means the energy spectrum, which goes like K raised to minus three. And what our study pointed out that the origin of that is because of the balance of net production, because of surface tension and nonlinear transfer, balancing viscous dissipation. Now in another 10, 15 minutes, I'll quickly summarize the picture which we have now. So this is the conclusion for B is equal to infinity, which I've already mentioned. Now we can ask the question, what happens when you have bubbles for stirring, plus stirring? And now that's even more difficult question because you also have a large scale driving mechanism. And so clearly, you know, doing very large output number simulations is more cumbersome, but motivated by the fact that even at small output numbers, you get the same statistical properties of pseudo turbulence. We went ahead and studied this problem at small output numbers and wherever possible made qual qualitative comparison with experiments to see whether our results agree with what experiments find or not. So this is what experiments find that for scales, which are larger than the bubble diameter, you have a minus five third scaling. And for scales, which are smaller than the bubble diameter, you have a minus three scaling. Note that over here, you don't expect anywhere to be a, to be a Kolmogorov dissipation scale because at small scales, you always have surface tension or the production because of surface tension transfers balancing viscous dissipation to give you a K raised to minus three scaling. <clears throat> so with that, let's start with the first question. What happens to the bubble trajectories? So if you increase turbulence steering, the bubbles no longer go straight up, but they have a more convoluted path. So therefore you find that the average rise velocity of the bubble actually, so remember if I say that B parameter decreases, that's equivalent to saying that I'm increasing the Reynolds number. So what you find is that as you increase the Reynolds number, which is like one over B, the average rise velocity of the bubbles decreases, which is not so surprising because now the bubble trajectory is not just going straight up, they take much more convoluted paths. Furthermore, indeed, if you plot the PDF of the bubble trajectory curvature, you would find that it's much more spread out clearly indicating that the path that the bubble follows is more curved. I mean, it's just one in the same statement. What's more interesting is that if you sit on each bubble and ask what is the average flow that I see around the bubble, what you find is that if there is no turbulence or if you have turbulence, the average flow which you would see if you were sitting on the bubble resembles that of a Stokesian, you know, uh, flow around a stair bubble, which is rising under the gravity. But the interesting observation is, these are drawn to the scale. The interesting observation is that in presence of bubble, in presence of turbulence, the bubble oscillates much more because the flow is now isotropized also. Um, the bubble, average bubble shape is much more spherical, right? And if you look at the weight flow around the bubble, what you find is that as you go on increasing turbulence intensity, the weight at the backside of the bubble becomes shorter and shorter. So R is equal to, so run R zero is the case where there is no large scale steering. As you increase the steering intensity, the weight becomes shorter and shorter, which means that the flow at the wake of the bubble is quickly isotropized because of the presence of external steering that is present. So it completely destroys the wake of the bubble. And this was also observed in the experiments where again they found that the wake in presence of large scale steering is attenuated, right? When you have turbulence present. So that's again was uh, encouraging. Again, you know, as I said earlier, 
the average velocity fluctuations are becoming isotropic so if you look at the pdf of velocity fluctuations they become more and more gaussian as you go on increasing turbulence intensity that's what is expected and consistent with experiments what we find is that for scales smaller than the bubble diameter you have a phi-third scaling and for scales which are sorry scales which are larger than the bubble diameter you have phi-third scaling whereas for the scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter you have the k raised to minus 3 scaling the energy budget actually becomes a bit more complex so b is equal to 0 is the case when you have no bubbles then you have the standard picture that turbulence injects energies at small scales it gets dissipated at sorry injects energy at large scales it gets dissipated at small scales and in between you have a nonlinear transfer which gives you the inertial range let me remind you because we wanted to have both bubbles and turbulence and scale separation the reynolds lambda is fairly moderate although the resolution is around 800 q the re lambda is only 70 which means we don't have a very large inertial range similarly for b is equal to infinity that is when you only have bubbles the picture is same as what i had pointed out to you earlier interesting thing happens when you go to large turbulence intensities uh, sorry this the left one should be 0.35 the right one should be 0.13 so at large turbulence intensities which is figure d and bottom left the nonlinear transfer is the dominant energy transfer mechanism up to bubble scales and also for scales which are uh, smaller than the bubble diameter however quite interestingly at these reynolds number and galilei numbers what you find is that the net production for scales smaller than bubble diameter still has a k inverse kind of a scaling or in this cumulative plot you would get a log k scaling similarly if you have lower turbulence intensity then the nonlinear transfer is a subdominant mechanism of transfer at scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter and the transfer is mostly because of the surface tension which is shown here in orange nevertheless the sum of the two still gives you a k inverse kind of a scaling for scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter so the picture that emerges is that when you have so again this should be interchanged so for b is equal to 0.13 should be read as 0.35 when you have smaller or low turbulence intensity then for scales which are smaller than the bubble diameter surface tension is the dominant transfer mechanism whereas for scale for b is equal to 0.13 which should be the figure d here uh, where the reynolds number is large the nonlinear transfer is a dominant transfer mechanism not only for scales which are larger than the bubble diameter but even for scales which are smaller than bubble diameter however the sum of the transfer due to surface tension and the nonlinearity still gives you a net production which goes as k inverse and this is what we have verified here that for scales which are smaller than bubble diameter if you look at make a compensated plot of the transfer you do see regions of a constant uh, transfer indicating that d by dk of the net production term the or cumulative production goes as k inverse indicating this balance the viscous dissipation balances net transfer giving you a k raised to minus 3 spectrum so the mechanism again is robust for scales smaller than the bubble diameters uh, and okay so this is more or less the conclusion and you know uh because of the excellent agreement with the experimental data we again conclude that you know for studying bubbly turbulence we are in actually in a very interesting regime where going to high output number at least at these volume fractions and for bubble diameters which are roughly 10 eta or closer to the taylor micro scale uh, it's not important to look exactly at the output numbers at same as the experiment but the statistical properties of the flow are fairly robust as long as you maintain the appropriate Galilei numbers. So there is a question in, okay, yeah. Uh, how to identify what lo local steering scale uh, which reaches the bubble location and the weight behind scale at global level, we know steering base scale, but near the R. Ah, so, so near the, you see the two scales of energy transfer our turbulence steering, which is a large scale injection, right? 
From there, it's the nonlinear transfer, which is transferring energy up to the bubble scale. So that's one scale which is generating fluctuations at the scale of bubbles. On top of it, the bubbles are rising because of the buoyancy. And that also is the energy injection mechanism that also injects energy at the scale of the bubbles. But that energy then is down transferred and in terms of wakes. So then at those scales, you have both the wakes produced by the bubble plus the nonlinear transfer, which is happening from large scales. Uh, I don't know how to decipher it into the wake flow and the turbulent flow at scales which are smaller than bubble diameter um, explicitly. I mean, I can decouple into nonlinear transfer versus the surface tension contributions, but not exactly into what exactly is the contribution due to wake or what exactly is the contribution because of turbulent steering because wake and the nonlinear flows because of turbulent steering are constantly interacting with each other. So do I answer your question, Raja? Right, right. Uh, no, I understood. Like uh, what you are trying to say is all the way from these large scales, somehow non-linearly that energy really pumps there. But at the local level, the bubble also pumps energy because of this buoyancy or surface tension based kind of thing. Now we cannot yeah. really backtrack like from where to where this energy actually comes near the bubble. Uh, the no, so you can backtrack in some sense in the scale by scale budget because you know that for scales which are much larger than the bubble diameter, the energy is trickling down because if there is a large scale steering, the energy is trickling down because of the nonlinear transfers. I see. Right, but just around the bubble scales, it's difficult because you have buoyancy and the which leads to you know deformation of the bubbles, capillary waves, which then relax, leading to wakes. But these wakes are also interacting with the turbulent flow, which is generated by large that's scale. Right, that's right. That's so, so how do we decipher the two? That's not clear to me. That's an open see. question. Yeah, I that's see. not clear. The, to me. So the near inverse cascade, what happens near the bubbles to large scales? We a kind of no, balance. Sorry, it, it, no, in our picture, there is no inverse cascade. There is no inverse cascade. So we didn't find any evidence nor any studies which look at the scale by scale energy budget have found any evidence of an inverse cascade in this system. Although that was what people initially used to think. Uh -huh. At so statistical sense, I mean, like at equilibrium, we don't see any uh, inverse kind of thing. But any given instant of time also, we cannot really say about that. Well, at any given instant of time, there would always be a backscatter. So that's, is, uh, there is nothing which rules out that. Right, right, right. If right. you look at triadic interactions, there would always be a backscatter. I but see, see. what I, we are talking of is a statistically steady uh, thing. See, so on average, there is no uh, net transfer within the energy budget that we saw. And I think that's what it is. So because, you know, turbulence also drives energy mostly to small scales. And these wakes, which I mean, if you want to think of it physically, the wakes which are generated, the largest wake structure could be half the bubble diameter, and then it disintegrates into smaller wakes, smaller structures. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. So first, we should thank you for the nice talk before we start the question answer session. All right. Uh, many thanks to. Uh,